to the third and sadly last day of our conference. Uh, thank you so much for being here and being here with us through all this amazing content. Uh, and now I'm just going to be uh, introduce myself really quickly and then I'm going to introduce these amazing people sitting here with me today. I don't know if I need the microphone. And I also wanted to um, ask you for be, to be patient with my English because I have to do this translation for my <laughs> Colombian uh, English accent to uh, a more appropriate accent today. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, Irish. <laughs> Do you hear me there well, or should I use the microphone? Microphone, microphone. okay. Uh, so my name is Viviana Mayor. I come from Colombia, as you already know, and uh, I work in this organization that is called La Metro. And what basic, basically what we do is we use art and culture for uh, different kind of projects, including social transformation projects, marketing projects, advertising projects, and um, we are here today to present this conversation, uh, the role of creative industries in reconciliation and pacific, uh, peaceful coexistence, sorry. And uh, we have here today, Karishma, Daniela, John, and Elara, and they are gonna introduce themselves but I think what, what I want to ask you be, after you do the, uh, your presentation uh, is that maybe we all can talk a little bit of what is cultural industries or what we understand by cultural industries to set a little framework for this conversation. Is that okay with you guys? Sounds good. Okay. Um, actually, the, those microphones should now be on. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. That's okay. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Should I get started? Okay. So I am Karishma and I'm here today on behalf of the Design Salon and Belfast Design Week, which are two ventures I helped co-found. Um, so the Design Salon started in 2014 and the reason we started it is because there was a space lacking in Belfast for certain areas of the creative industries and the design sector as well. So there was a lot of support for things like animation and film and maybe tech as well, but for things like graphic design, for fashion designers and then other elements of the design industry, that was completely missing. So what we decided to do was set up a community where we could all meet um, initially on a monthly basis and come up with ideas ideas for various projects. One of the projects was the Another Belfast map, and what it was was a big physical bright orange map, which is slightly controversial in Belfast, but it was uh, very popular, and people pinned it up on their walls, they took it away, and we wanted it to be a physical thing rather than a digital thing, so it would be almost like a souvenir of Belfast, something you could show off and be proud about. What it did was showcase independent places and spaces, so places that would be forgotten about on the more commercial tourism maps, um, places like record stores, dumpling shops, the small businesses and people that deserved a shout out from all of us in Belfast. Um, the other project that stemmed from that was Belfast Design Week, which is a much bigger project and in its fourth year this year. And it's actually on next week as well. So this week I've been running around, going a bit crazy, <laughs> trying to, <laughs> to get all of that sorted. So I'm one of the co-founders of that. And the reason we set up Belfast Design Week was to have an annual event where everybody in Belfast that's involved in the design industry, but also people from the general public that have some knowledge of design or want to get to know about design could also get involved. Um, we thought there was a space uh, for design because there was a lot of support for the craft sector and for the tech sector, like I mentioned previously. So there was nothing really in terms of design as a huge week. The other reason we set it up was also because across the world there are lots of design weeks. So there's London Design Week, Dublin, there's Portland. So we were looking at other places in the world and we wanted to make Belfast a design destination. Um, it has a lot of social outreach um, in terms of what we do, but it's almost integrated into the whole program itself as well. So we have a lot of workshops, conferences and um, exhibitions, different events of various kinds. We have our core events, but then we engage people locally to do their own 
fringe events as well. So anybody can join in, set up an independent event and become part of Design Week. So we wanted to keep it quite open and accessible to everybody in the city, whether it was somebody starting out, a student, somebody that's never done anything before in design, as well as bigger companies as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, hi everyone, I'm Daniela Zuluaga. Uh, I'm from Colombia and I'm here on behalf of FTC Studio. We are a creative studio, a small business in Colombia, not in the capital of Colombia. And we have, uh, we work with traditional and commercial advertisement, uh, branding and commercial brands, but also we have in the very core of our value proposition, social transformation as a, a way to add value for our clients or build value with our clients. So uh, we have been able to develop um, a lot of projects. Uh, well, at, at least for me, that's a lot of projects, but um, I want to talk to you about uh, a few. For example, we have worked with the music industry. We have been able to work uh, with artists, like they have some kind of recognition, and we encourage them to work um, with communities. For example, we have made um, some music videos with communities in uh, rural areas of Colombia or impoverished neighborhoods of Ibagué, which is the city I, wa uh, I, I live in. And um, they, we work with them, uh, we spend some time with the community, we make uh, some groups with uh, the community, uh, they get involved into the production and we also uh, give, for example, we do something like giving them a private concert. We, for example, do uh, a mural as a part of the stage of the video music, music video. And um, later that uh, the, the, the spreading of the video is part of also a strategy to promote uh, territory recognition, uh, to enhance the identity, uh, to call attention of local governments and it becomes like a, a chain and a snowball. That's what at least what uh, we are trying to do. And yeah, th this is the kind of projects that we, we do. And about uh, the question of what I understand for creative industries, you, you have mentioned that design, filmmaking, uh, art itself, but um, also I think that creative industries uh, are about what, what can we create based on ideas. Uh, and that's huge because ideas are apparently nothing, apparently like abstract, but ideas are very powerful and how can we be created, creative about that and how can we like make a lot from nothing apparently. So yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm John Pito from uh, an organization called the Nerve Center based in Derry, which is uh, Northern Ireland's second city. Um, we're living very much in the shadow of Belfast. Um, <laughs> thank you for organising a nine o'clock panel in Belfast. Um, I, can, I can assure you there wouldn't be many people from Belfast that have come to Derry for a nine o'clock panel. But, uh, um, so we're an organisation that was established by a group of young rock musicians um, in the late 1980s. Um, and at that stage, Derry was very much um, a site of conflict, a, a, a city in um, political contest, depending on your, your viewpoint and the city centre was, was under occupation from the British military or under attack from the IRA and the Irish Republican Army. Freedom of movement was restricted um, for people generally, but if you were a young musician trying to transport amps, drums, guitars, whatever else, it was particularly restrictive and particularly um, difficult to move around. Um, the city has suffered from endemic um, social deprivation, multi-generational unemployment, all of the corresponding health inequalities that come as a result of that and um, open and sort of less open discrimination in terms of politics and economic investment within Northern Ireland. So it comes from a, a pretty um, conflict-rooted place and a group of, of young people who were really interested in finding a place to play music which was affordable for them to access, people in a, a, an area of high deprivation who were, were unemployed and a, a, a collective where they could share instruments and, a, and sort of so that 
an amp or a guitar could be used by three or four or five different bands instead of all of those people having to buy their own equipment, their own um, uh, set up to play music. So from that, those kind of roots as a, as a collective of young people in the late 1980s, the organization evolved um, and became a sort of hub for young people and creativity general, ge generally. And the sort of notion of creative industries um, that hopefully we'll explore a little bit this morning is this tension between creativity and industry um, is, is very much the sort of story and journey of the nerve center because from music, um, as, as creative young people began to cluster around a place that was, I would say as well, overtly apolitical in terms of sectarian politics in Northern Ireland. It really was a place where, where people were interested in music and actively disinterested in <coughs> the sectarian politics, which defined every other facet of life for people in Northern Ireland and still does to some extent. Um, people who were interested in films, watching films and then starting to make films began to sort of cluster and coalesce around the organization. We started to make films um, where youth had a voice, music youth had a voice, giving people a platform to express their own opinions because Northern Ireland, like, like many sites of conflict, had been a place where um, media from outside came and sort of imposed identities and narratives upon people which, which were very simplistic and not always very representative. So we're giving young people the tools and platforms to create their own voice, to, to develop their own stories and their own films, their own pieces of music, their own animations, graphic novels, and it really grew from, from that. Um, and we had a sort of very steady development until the late um, 1990s. 1998, as we know, this is the 20th anniversary of the peace process, um, the Good Friday Agreement, sorry, in, in Northern Ireland here. And through sort of serendipity, timing and good luck, a film that had been made within the Nerve Centre under a short filmmaking scheme because it told um, what many of us within the organisation feel is quite a cliché story of love across the barricades. Um, a, a young Protestant girl who wants to become an Irish dancer, a river dancer, um, for, for reasons around that sort of international interest in the peace process and what was happening here, was nominated for an Oscar. And suddenly, a small organisation started by rock musicians who were sort of countercultural outsiders in this sort of peripheral city, in this peripheral part of Europe, became people who were creative industries um, professionals or contributors or whatever else. And from that sort of platform, the organisation has grown exponentially to the state where now um, we work across a range of digital media. Creativity is at our core, but we're not media specific. So we work in digital fabrication, film, music, um, app creation, coding, whatever it might be, robotics. Um, and we use that sort of creative base as a tool to bring people together to build relationships and grow from there, but also in recent years to develop creative industries, potentials and, and skills. And when I talk about that tension that hopefully we'll, we'll explore this morning, is around the original notion of creativity for the sake of it as something for young people or people generally to escape from some of their realities, to express themselves and come together. And then the tension once you add a, an economic imperative on that towards sustainability, towards making money um, and towards industrial development, how you can ride those two horses and still retain some of those potentially reconciliation and peace building outputs, outputs whilst making money or at least sustaining yourself. Yeah. I think, I think, sorry, before Elada makes her introduction, I think that's what we've been talking about is precisely that, how, that tension, how we can like balance the, the creativity side and, and, and the economic value that creative industry can add to, to general society. So just, yeah. Well, um, basically, good morning. Happy Halloween, happy pagan <laughs> spirits uh, holiday. Um, so yes, uh, this is a question that is also uh, at the center of discussions that we are having at the beginning of a project. So uh, these uh, lovely people will be the, the godparents of this project that I will be talking to you about. Um, and this project is the Garage of the Riña, uh, and it's a garage space. Um, if you want to see what it looks like on Facebook or Instagram, we are under that name, the Garage of Verinha. Verinha is D-E-R-Y-N-E-I-A. Um, so Verinha is a village that you do not know. Um, and it's on the buffer zone between the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot communities on the south of the island, which is the Greek Cypriot part. And to tell you about Verinha and about the garage, I will tell you a little story. Parts of it are scary. But you know, it's the day. Um, so, uh, the story of tensions between the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot communities in Cyprus uh, started in 1963 with 
uh, intercommunal violence. Um, and uh, by 1974, and the war, uh, the occupation of the north part of the island uh, by Turkish forces that still stands, uh, uh, basically uh, managed to uh, segregate the communities, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, uh, completely from 1974 to 2003. Uh, so I grew up um, and I had never met a Turkish Cypriot, a Greek Cypriot woman, until I was 21 years old. So this is complete segregation. Um, and in 2003, the first checkpoint started to open. Um, so from that point on until now, 2018, there have been five checkpoints that have six that have opened between the two sides, making this line of separation rather more porous. Um, so uh, in also the story of the development of a civil society on the island, the first reconciliation efforts between the communities start in the late 90s, early 2000s. I think we're also riding on the bandwagon of the Good Friday Agreement in the hope that we've resolved one of the tensions in Europe. Uh, as Cyprus is also going into the EU, let's try to resolve another one. So the um, the peace building uh, organizations came to the island, uh, started to bring people together, um, which however didn't result in, in a peace agreement. It resulted in a plan in 2004 by the Secretary General of the United Nations, which when it went to referendum, uh, did, did, was, was rejected by the Greek Cypriot community, approved by the Turkish Cypriot community. So we basically lost a chance for a solution then. Um, again, as I said before, uh, this line between the two communities, we, ours is a green line, uh, started to become a lot more porous when checkpoints started to open. But next to this small village on the east of the island called Verinha, there was a road that led from the village, from the center of the village, all the way down to the city of Famagusta. Right? I don't know what you guys know about Famagusta, but part of the city is completely militarized. Part of it is a medieval wonder of Venetian architecture. And part of it has been closed off since 1974 uh, in what is now a ghost city that's crumbling and falling. So you have a village on the one side, and then this road leads straight into this very contested space that it's in itself struggling with trying to reconcile what has been all the trauma of, uh, of the war and of the violence. Um, so now I'll bring us back into reality. Um, in Famagusta on this road, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Verinho on this road that is called um, Famagusta Avenue, ironically enough, which has a roadblock in the middle, so you can go up to a point. You see Famagusta and the sea on the horizon, but you could not go through. There was a garage. This garage was owned by a family. It was a family-owned business. Uh, so when the father, Mr. Theoris, died a few years ago, uh, the municipality made a proposal to the family uh, to take on the garage and make it into a community uh, peace building space. Um, only five years later, uh, <laughs> some initial seed funding was found. Uh, but yes, honestly though, through, the, um, through uh, initial funding by the United Nations Peacekeeping Force, uh, this space was made from a garage, a dusty, oily, uh, you know, uh, closed industrial space into what is now basically not a black box, but a white box. It's an empty space. If you go onto the website or the Instagram account, you'll be able to see it. Um, and it's on the road leading to the checkpoint. I also need to say that, I wasn't going to mention this, but it's, it's, uh, it's great news, but uh, the, on the 12th of November, the Verinha checkpoint will actually open. So we will officially be on the crossing point between Famagusta and Verinha. Um, so uh, in May this year, the space was cleaned up, uh, and um, the United Nations came to my theater group, uh, called Rooftop Theater Group, uh, to say, would you like to help us with community engagement? So we did what we usually do when we do our theater work, is we put out an open call to people saying, would you like to help us to uh, think creatively around the space? So we had academics that came, uh, are a lot of people from the artistic community uh, from all around the island, but more importantly, we had people from Verinha come, and also people from Famagusta. So people from Verinha would be Greek Cypriots, people from Famagusta would be Turkish Cypriots. So we had um, three meetings in May and June with a large collection of people in which we asked, so what, what would you like this space to be? At the beginning of July, we had a, a wonderful party opening um, there at the space. 
And then at the end of July, we realized that we didn't actually have a plan about how to move ahead. Um, so we started to um, kind of reconsider our approach and we decided that the way to go was a steering committee. So now we're at the phase where we are uh, putting together an entity which will hopefully comprise of the following players. And honestly, we are very open to your feedback and this is also one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, I'm here to present a project in progress and to ask for your, for your help. Um, so who, we would like, who would we like to involve in this process? Uh, as with a lot of the work of my colleagues, it would be predominantly the local community, trying to empower those. Local community being the people of the Rinha of the village and the people of Famagusta. So both entities coming in. Uh, there are uh, NGOs that are active in the area and individual artists. There are also people that have been um, involved with peace building for years in Nicosia, right? With the capital, which is actually split in the middle. So there's a lot of what we call bicommunal organizations that have existed for years um, in the capital. We would also love them to be part of this conversation because there have been a lot of success stories, but there have also been a lot of uh, very kind of troubled. Um, histories of reconciliation, a lot of forced marriages that kind of had stemmed from large-scale funding, and I know that um, Colombians and Northern Irish people, you know what I'm talking about, uh, a lot of programmatic peace building. Um, and then there are the other, uh, our secret allies, which are the artists, and which are the academics and the university communities. Uh, a lot of them are thirsting for these types of projects that are grounded. Um, um, so, that's basically that is the stage we're at um, and um, inputs ideas uh, about and thoughts around what could be the creative industries for us and what could be our, our an organic connection to peace building uh, and to reconciliation with all the communities in the area greek cypriots Circus cypriots migrants um, people with workers' permits that come to Cyprus for, to work for four years and they have no feeling of belonging. Uh, students that might also have the same type of approach. Um, this is our community and these are our dilemmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, based on, on these, uh, like, these stories that we've been hearing, I would like to ask the audience uh, if we can just like, come up with some words when you when somebody said to you creative industries what do you think of does anyone in, wants to break the ice and say some words for us what do you think we we were hearing about ideas we could think about identity as well we could think about narratives what else what else do you think when when you hear this term creative industries Pushing the boundary. Thank you. What else? Violation. Sorry? So it would be a matter of like reimagining re some some community. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So basically, and I don't know if if we want to like wrap it up a little bit. The idea of creative industries. Um, for me personally, creative industries are based on all those things that you've been saying, of course, because. And, and I think the main difference between other industries is that creative industries has the potential not to only create economic value, but also like this uh, social cohesion that uh, makes them very different from other industries. So um, maybe just, I, I am thinking that creative industries are about identity, revitalization, reimagination, social cohesion, and how around those ideas you construct products and goods that can be like 
commerce uh, trade and also that thrive social cohesion at the base. Um, that's what I'm thinking, but if anyone has anything to say, gladly to hear. Yeah. yeah. Can I eat them? Um, I, I, I wish that was true. Yeah. I think that in, in my um, heart, I think that's probably a, a, a very romanticized notion of what the creative industries yeah. are because increasingly it's not the creative, it's the industry part and it's really around in the, at the political level, the, the kind of commodification of the arts and of course we can argue the arts have always been commodified but um, no longer for organizations that are trying to do creative work on the ground is it really about your, um, the kind of outputs that you're talking about, it's about your economic bottom line. If you can make a, a, some kind of economic argument for what you're doing, then it becomes a viable proposition for, for funding support. Whereas if it's around social outputs, the argument becomes much harder. So um, uh, us as an organization, the Nerve Center, we've positioned some of what we do within the creative industry space because it's a valid fit, but also because it makes us a much more palatable um, proposition for funders to, to buy into so that they can show some kind of economic output. But I, I, I fear that in the sort of funding milieu that we all have to exist in, that actually the emphasis is on the industry rather than the creative, and it becomes around jobs and rather than social benefits and impacts on people and relationships and communities. Okay. Yeah, so related to that, that was going to be my next question, because uh, we, like we in this field, tend to always be between that tension that if we are creative and socially valuable enough and if we get really industrious, we will lose that social and creative side. Well, that's, I think, the common belief. I, I wanted to ask you, how do you manage and what tools you see we can use not to, to like soften this tension and rather to find a synergy between economic and creative and social, uh, creative slash social value. And what, what, in your experience, what tools have you been using to reduce the tension and maybe have a, a different view, a different approach to it? Well, if I, if I take that one, I think that it's important to have diversity in the projects you're doing. So that's not just in the people involved, but also the types of projects. I know with Design Week we have everything from a mix of really or business focused UX events with more tech companies all the way down to really small scale independent artists doing things. And I think it's important to support both sides of this because I think you can't really just be single minded in terms of what creative industries are because they are also very diverse. And the other thing is also collaborating because, um, I mean, I couldn't have set up Design Week on my own. It's all about co-founding with other people and other specialisms. But I also think that that's the same in terms of any projects as well, that you should be involving the wider community, not necessarily even from the creative industries. It could be somebody in a completely different industry. We were talking about people in agriculture earlier on, and these things aren't as far apart as you would think. One of the events we're doing at Design Week is Design Science. Again, there are two industries people think of as being so separate, but actually they have a lot of um, common ground as well. So I think it's all about that, about diversity and collaboration, I think is key. And I think it's okay to have a business mind as well when it comes to being in the creative industries. And that makes me sound like a sellout. But at the same time, I think it's important to be sustainable. You shouldn't have to be a starving artist to do something creative as well. I think you should be able to uh, self-sustain and take care of yourself. And maybe that does mean being more business-minded and being more industry-focused as well. Uh, yeah, um, I, I want to add something to the conversation. And maybe uh, it's related to what you were talking about. And may it sound a little bit maybe weird, I don't know. but. I think that we have to be really, um, we have to take some risks and if we are talking about creative industries, we have to think like business person. So I think the, the, the most important thing to do is also be creative about the business stuff. So how can we do, how can we think about doing this profitable how can we challenge the industry and of course it's uh, i mean 
peace building is not charity and and if you own a business you are going to do whatever you need to do in order to keep that uh, business profitable successful so that's the way i think we can work and challenge ourselves because we are i'm talking about me and my crew uh, we are we, we choose that this is our life project so we want to rock it we want to do it good and we want to do it profitable also because we are we are living from this so um this is uh this is a very important point because sometimes we we talk from a very romantic and idealistic point of view like yeah we're going to change the world everything is beautiful and we're we are so such a good persons but we we also have to challenge ourselves to think further and to think uh, to yeah be creative not just uh, about the content but also about the business model about uh, the stakeholders and everything that's around about the creative industry um, if I may put in my two cents I I think that also to um, thinking about Monica's point about what is the danger of uh, kind of cutting a, a, an organic development of a place because of the creative industries and making it into something that it's not. One of the, the things that we are thinking about quite intensely is the idea that we are very much grounded in this space, right? And this space is um, in itself uh, loaded with history, it's loaded with uh, experience. Uh, in the case of some places, it's even loaded with a lot of trauma, and this is not something that we can neglect. And this is something that needs to be part of the game without us fearing that, you know, we are kind of um, messing with a traumatic past. Um, what we are thinking as the Garage of the Rinya, as kind of this, of this ensemble, is that whatever we do, um, if we involve artists and farmers and people that will engage with the space, we need to be aware that we're in a post-conflict place post-conflict space, that people need to make a living by acknowledging, though, where each person comes from, what are their needs, and what have they gone through. So the, contested, the contestedness of the space is something that is really important in the, in the work that we hope to be doing. We're not working in a vacuum and there's no prescribed solutions, you know, <laughs> things that look pretty on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that we kind of need to be aware of, and I think it's like having a, a, a history, a rather long history in peace building on the island, we're aware that there are a lot of nuances. Um, so we need to be aware of those. Um, creative industries, okay, we're definitely not there yet. <laughs> we don't even know what it is. However, um, in the process of planning, uh, and it's good that we are a blank slate, I guess, uh, the, this is a thing that we are very conscious of, we don't, that we do not work in a vacuum. Yeah, I, I related to that. I was also thinking that do you do you like when you are planning, when you were planning or when you are constantly planning projects, do you think of the challenges or the risks of using some given cultural expression instead of another that may cause marginalization or isolation of grounded communities? Because we tend to think, or at least I personally, we tend, we tend to think that culture and art are like neutral, like they are just good themselves in some cases, uh, just like this romantic idea that art can save the world and that art can fix almost like, but do you, when, when you were thinking about your projects, did you think that using a specific cultural expression can, and, uh, can isolate another grounded expressions that were important for the project? I think um, in terms of Belfast itself, often the focus is on two communities, but the reality of it is it's becoming a much more multicultural city. It's getting a lot more people moving to Belfast from other parts of the world, and Belfast is a much more diverse place than it was in the past. And I think we're trying to encourage people that wouldn't normally seek out design and creative industries to come in, but also support things that are existing. So I think it's about catering to your audience, but also about understanding, like you said, their background, where they're from, and the reasons that they might want to join the creative industries as well. Um, I think that it's really important, though, to just be aware of 
the past and the history before you set up things because I think sometimes um, if you're especially in a conflict or post-conflict region you're coming in and setting something up there might be some things in the past that might affect the kinds of projects that you set up and it might even add to something completely new that the world hasn't seen before so you can use it to inform a really interesting new way of thinking but also to be um, culturally sensitive and aware of what's happening in the city as well. Yeah, I think the, the idea of, of culture being neutral the fact that we don't have a government in Northern Ireland at the moment, on the face of it, is about culture and language. You know, it's a lack of agreement, a failure to agree on, on culture and language. Part of, of the approach we've taken, and um, particularly with, with new and emerging technologies, is that actually technology is, is neutral, um, because it's generally about the future rather than the past. Um, most things in Northern Ireland, as in Cyprus, as in Colombia, whether it's sport, music, um, the places you choose to go, most of them have some kind of um, ownership from one side of the community or another and you can sort of drill down and identify um, where you might think people come from or what views they might hold, whereas technology often is a neutral starting point because one, the technology hasn't been applied retrospectively yet, but also people are often coming from a shared point of ignorance where they have to go on a shared journey of learning and discovery as to how to use that and how to apply that and through that journey is where collaboration takes place often about things that are neutral and non-political because nobody wants to have those awkward conversations but once you've developed the, the core relationships where we've both learned how to use a 3D printer then you can start to have the deeper conversations that go on from that. But in, in terms of the, the creative industry side as well I think part of the danger of, of the sort of current um, emphasis on creative industries is that um, if, if a project like the Nerve Centre had been conceived or framed as a creative industries project. It would have ended years ago. It was really about people coming together to be able to play music. Somebody um, within actually you know, a, a visionary, which this isn't a phrase that's used often, a visionary within Derry City Council um, gave the money to buy that equipment. And then 30 years later, there is a creative industries project that's employing 50 people across um, four different sites in, in Northern Ireland. But if it had been conceived as a creative industries project from day one, the, the passion, the interest, the enthusiasm would have died off years ago. There was a time in the, the sort of um, gestation of the project where people were sleeping in the building because uh, the, the, the end of the, the wall on the end of the building had been pulled down by a developer that was building a place next door. And that's because they were completely invested in the culture of music and film and sort of youth activity, not because they were invested in the idea of, of job creation or, or economic impact. And I think that's that's part of the danger is that sometimes the innovation that can lead to the industrial or the economic output comes from the creative route, but actually the, the, the emphasis around trying to raise money to do that in the modern in, environment is all around the economic side rather than the cultural side. Okay. You want to add something? I wanted to ask, when you say technology, you mean te tech tools? Yes. Uh, as in, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe something about... Um, I was thinking about them, this uh, isolation or marginal, marginalization, and uh, something what we that we do in our the way we work is um, we are like we used uh, some techniques, some tools, uh, human centered design as a tool, um, um, but I think like uh, being a good uh, observer, if I can say that. Uh, sometimes when you have this uh, a project, you you can't have everyone happy in a, in a context, but you can tell what a, what is what is going to happen, uh, or maybe how can you manage, or how, how can you minimize that risk of isolation, and always uh, thinking in, I, I hate that word beneficiary, uh, but I, I prefer to use participants or even users because they are part of our project and as we are industries we also have to think uh, about them as final users or how can I get involved the most uh, quantity of people and how can I get involved uh, yeah users to my project so that's what I, it comes to my mind when you ask that yeah question. and I think a, a good word also that could help like Assessing that risks, or at least the the conscience of them, is the world very industries work stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Like you have these 
you are not in a vacuum, you are grounded, uh, community grounded, and you will have to look at every stakeholder you have. Either is a client, the industry, the politicians, the community, the comp you know, like it's like a, a good sense of how you can, well, personally, I think that the, the, the word the stakeholder could help also to like, at least be conscious of mm. where are you working and with, with, with whom you are working at, at the end. That's, and I wanted to just like jump into another um, tension or relation uh, that I don't know if you think or what do you think about how can tech tools specifically can enhance uh, creative or cultural industries reach um, not just being uh, like not just being part of a communication strategy, but how can really tech, for example, tech and art can just like enhance this reconciliation and peace building processes, or this uh, tech and design can really enhance uh, the, the social impact of... I, I think that there are two industries that could really benefit from each other because I think if you're in one or the other, you're working in your own sphere, but whenever the two collide, you can come up with really interesting things. Um, recently, some of the bigger tech companies, places like Facebook, have set up um, analog research centers where they invite illustrators and designers in to set up shop and do things there. Um, not sure what everyone's view of Facebook is as a company. Obviously, there's a lot of ethical issues around what Facebook does. Um, but it's that sort of thing that if some uh, bigger company is um, able to fund artists and organizations to do things, I think that can work really well. In terms of using new technologies as well, a lot of people in creative industries are now looking at ways of using things like augmented and mixed realities and virtual reality as well. And that can work really well across so many areas of art and music and design and lots of other parts of the creative industries as well. So I think um, sometimes art is thought of as a very traditional thing, but actually it can be really contemporary and forward thinking. and we know this as people that are involved in the creative sector, but I think the general public sometimes sees it as one thing. So it's about maybe making things that are more public facing and engaging more of the general public in art and technology, about upskilling maybe people in the creative industries um, on how to use different tech products. Mm. I think like John had mentioned as well, about maybe bringing communities together through learning new tech skills. Um, and also collaborating because you don't always have to specialize in something um, to be able to work with it. So you could be an artist working purely in one form and you could meet somebody that is purely working in code and then collaborate and make something totally different and new as well. So I think there's a lot of ways of the two bits engaging together as well. Um, for us, the, the issue of technology in relation to kind of creating new creative sectors is also informed very much by the fact that Cyprus is a very small place. So news does travel. So in terms of outreaching, part of that is covered by word of mouth. A large part is covered by word of mouth. So um, we have the experience of a platform of a platform for social engagement that we had worked on with Elena and Michaela some, some years ago. And um, what, we, what we know from that experience is that a platform that engage, engages youth um, and generally stakeholders around peace building in creating social cohesion is something that has the danger of slowly dying uh, unless it's nurtured. And um, what I mean by that is unless there is more funding available. Um, so there is, it's a very delicate balance in, and I, I don't know if this is a matter of small spaces, you can also um, t tell me what you think, but uh, because, so Northern Ireland is not a, it's not a huge place. Uh, but there are inherent dangers in how you can create that sort of a, of a platform for creativity or for outreach unless there's a community that would um, sustain it. And I don't know if, I don't know which comes first, I don't know if it's a chicken and egg thing. Do you build a community and then make sure that this is something that can sustain the platform? Or is, is the platform that something that would create the community? Because in the other platform that we had done, I think we were going for the latter and it didn't work at the end of the day because, you know, 
uh, didn't have a stable grounding at the end of the day, which was funding. Um, and it's just something that I'm thinking about how, you know, the size of a place and the size of a community, especially when it comes to peace building, can really be a determining factor in how you design it and run it. So we have two two real layers of, of how we use tech around reconciliation and peace building, and one is um, very much uh, the key issue we have with the past, um, apart from the, you know, we, we don't discuss it, we don't address it, we have very um, sophisticated ways of avoiding it in, in, in all sorts of spheres of life, and schools have been part of that, through no fault of schools, through levels of um, knowledge, confidence. we don't have an agreed understanding of the past here, so it's very unfair to expect a teacher to be able to teach mm -hmm. the, the past in any um, sort of confident way. So we use technology as a way of engaging young people who are generally switched off from the, 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 the conflict here. The past has been middle-aged men in suits shouting at each other, arguing with each other on the television news at night, and you know, for any young person yeah. it's an instant switch off. So by using the, the, the carrot of learning creative digital media skills, we get them to interrogate the past. So if you, you know, to, to learn filmmaking, to learn animation, you do that by coming through a structured program which teaches you about the past. The way we've got schools to engage with that is to give teachers free training in learning about the digital technologies, which they can then apply in their other practice, as long as they teach some of the conflict around that. But the other element has been through our digital fabrication program, Fab Labs, and really, um, to, to, to come back to that industry side of it, when we talk to people at the community level and we, we do um, design thinking and human-centered design uh, around some of our um, program development and ideation, in communities that we work with, they want job skills, they want work skills. The, the key sort of um, mm. impact of the conflict in, in sort of most working class areas of Northern Ireland is, is, is economic, it's not political, um, and, and they want skills to be able to develop jobs. So. Mm -hmm. And the Fab Lab project has been working at a community level in Belfast and in Derry. And in, in Derry, two years ago, we set up the second Fab Lab, called Fab Social, which is embedded within um, sort of one of the most deprived um, districts of the city as a specific Fab Lab around social impact in that community. And when we went worked with the community around the design thinking process, it was all around accredited job skills and how to use digital technologies creatively to set up micro enterprises to develop skills um, around social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm private entrepreneurship and, and development like that. So to me, that's almost encouraging because I think that's a sign of a, of a healthy, normalizing society that, that people um, want to develop sort of skills just to gain employment. They're not that interested around some of the social division stuff. They're more focused on, on moving forward and, and going from there. Yes, what I want to add is that um, tech tools are part of our day-to-day -day life. Uh, it are very important for us. Uh, and what we do is that we, we use that as part of our job. Um, for example, I don't, I don't, we were talking about platforms and, and how can we create some new Instagram profile, Facebook profile, but um, sometimes it's just um, going further and think how can we challenge ourselves and think about how profitable are social media, for example. And what we do is uh, do some research about pay-per-view in YouTube and how can we involve that in our projects and that, I mean, at my whole point is going around that uh, business-oriented mindset mm -hmm. and is I think that we we as social workers or people who is working for social transformation, um, we, we can challenge ourselves to think um, how, can, how can we make the most of technology, tools, uh, platforms that are available for us in, in that world. So uh, did, this also requires creativity and this also requires mm. uh, research, uh, uh, education and developing a, a, a lot of uh, abilities, skills, to in order to apply that for the content on the or the essence of the work that we want to do. I mean, we have this. We know for sure that we want to do social <coughs> work and social transformation, and that we want to work uh, uh, around peace building. But 
let's do it in a different and very creative way. And technology is there uh, as a, not just as a tool. Is we are in that stream. We are we are right there, and we are living our lives around technology. We are using that. We are uh, maybe as we said uh, the first day, we are being used by that maybe also. So okay. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to know if someone has any question uh, or wants to add something to the conversation. I see Whoa. four hands. Uh, I'm gonna maybe start with Monica that she was telling me <laughs> she, she had a question before, and then we can go like, sorry, your name? Min. Min. Omar and Natasha. Natasha. Okay. Hello. All right. Um, so I see creativity as value, not necessarily economy. I think money is one form of value. And we've been talking only about that form. We can add a lot of other values. Um, so what I value, and, and I'm speaking as um, I founded Activate Labs, we do a lot of creative and arts-based work, and we need money. I have two children that, I guess, have to eat food. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm keenly aware of this pressure, right? And, um, but I wonder. But I'm also, what I also value is something that I'm kind of being obsessed about is the idea of decolonizing peace building. And decolonizing, and what I, by, what I mean by that is there's systems of oppression like patriarchy or capitalism that, that we function under. And I think we have a very, very um, clear calling in peace building to, to really change that. And I'm feeling like we're under that pressure in this conversation of really of a colonial power of capitalism. And it feels really like, and I think that could even stop um, creativity. And so I'm wondering, you know, what role in your personal work or what, what are your thoughts about the role of creativity as a way of uh, decolonizing these spaces? Um, and what can we, maybe, maybe, maybe it's something we have to shift power. Maybe it's a step we have to take. Maybe we're not there yet. But like, what can we do? Because I don't want to do the same things over and over again. It's not working. And like you said, funding, fund, yes, of course, funding is always gonna be needed because I mean, that's how this world works. But is there other added value? Is there like another creative economy we could create that's not maybe with this money? Just think. Yeah, um, I, think, I think you're right that money and business always does come up in discussions of creative industry, but I think it's because it's always bubbling under the surface because it's something that creative industries often struggle with and how to make themselves sustainable. So I think it's always there and that concern's always there, so it always comes up. Um, in terms of decolonizing creative industries and working in a different way, um, from my own experience with Design Week, I think one of the things we've done is get a really diverse panel of people actually organizing Design Week as well, yeah. because I think what that brings is a range of perspectives that me and my own or any of the other team couldn't bring to the table. So I think it's starting at that sort of high level and the people actually doing things, getting involved in projects and organizing are from a range of backgrounds. Um, particular to Northern Ireland, that it's not just a Protestant or Catholic background, it's maybe people from the LGBTQ community, it's maybe from people of different races, people that are from different uh, backgrounds as well. Um, and I think that's really key um, to create a project that is truly um, looking at diversity properly <laughs> and creating a project that is not just focusing on um, issues and the conflict that used to exist, but actually moving on and creating something totally different and new. Can I add one thing? Completely agree with what you said. What I would add is also acknowledging what the social fabric of societies is now. Also relating to how um, permanency of habitation is not something that exists for a lot of people. So within communities, there are people that um, have that are well, migrants, basically, were forced to leave their countries. They might be in transit, still living there, right? They're part of who we are. Uh, also, there is, especially in our part of the world, and I'm sure in many of your countries, there are people that uh, that come on these, you know, fabulous workers' visas. Also, part of the community, largely unacknowledged, and another group that has a bit of the kind of economic upper hand are tourists. So there are uh, there are very diverse groups that don't really have a. Like a permanent position in communities uh, that are outside the dichotomy that was created by colonization. In our case, it's Greek Cypriot, Turkish Cypriot. They're outside that narrative. And to include them, for me, it's also an, a little bit an act of rebellion, uh, to say that, yes, you are part of us, although you might be here for six months or four years based on your visa. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, just not not a question, just to, to offer a reflection. I really want to thank you for raising the whole notion of commodification. I think I think the conversation is is really nuanced. And what I want to add to that is this whole sort of discourse around instrumentalization of, of culture and and how that is also not often talked about. Um, and you know, when we talk about social cohesion, diversity, we talk about it as if it's it's not that it's benign when in fact it isn't benign. So how how does arts and culture, for example, flatten you know the terrain instead of you know making it explode and, and encouraging debate and and all of that? Because you know who makes decisions around who's included and not. Uh, you know, so so I think there's more to the conversation. There is that certainly when we talk about the commodification, uh, there is a political analysis around that, which I think I think conversations like this and you know in and outside of this university must must be engaged in. So I just wanted to put that on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think we have to wrap up. But we are gladly to talk to Omar and Natasha uh, in the meantime, or networking lunch, or, or you just can write us back. But thank you all for we'll just, just hearing us. Maybe yeah. Response, or we just get to hear the questions that are in the floor. Yeah, I agree. Well, if we could do that, it would be great. At yeah, least. but we just have like really one minute. I'm sorry. If you can do a brief question each, yeah. then that's great. But then we're going to have to move along. I'm happy to yield my time to everyone. <laughs> I can ask you personally. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, my mine was not a question. It was more a reflection, and again, highlighting the points of well, all of us should be doing social cohesion and conflict management. It's part of our work and also our responsibility. Everything from tech to arts to wash should be doing social cohesion and conflict management. So it's not a one. Uh, sector responsibility, but also also highlighting that art as well has inherent bias, and I'm from South America, where arts have been traditionally wide and male and urban and elitist, so we have to be very intentional and cognizant of the biases that we might have. So it's very also very dangerous, this narrative that we can, yeah, we're, we are excluding when we say, okay, art's already there doing those things, and I like that a lot of the panelists actually highlighted the fact that we have to be intentional of who we are included if we are doing this right, because it has to be participatory in order to reach those outcomes. So that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Were there any other pressing comments, reflections? Otherwise, we shall move on to the next session.